Good afternoon. So how many of you are in love? Come on, raise those hands high. How many of you are in relationships? How many of you plan on getting married? Okay, so let's quickly talk about what we look for in a partner. Uh, obviously, the person has to be good looking, uh, well educated, with a good family background, probably some strong values, um, ambitious goals for life, and a few shared hobbies. Wouldn't you agree? I was in your shoes 12 years ago. I was in love with my childhood best friend. And he checked all of these boxes. So we got married, we had the big wedding, we traveled all over the world, and now he's my ex-husband. There was no violence, there was no drugs, there was no cheating. You're probably wondering, what happened? And believe me, I was wondering the same thing. I spent the last three years researching everything I can on relationship and patterns in relationships to answer this question. And I'm here today to share with you what I've learned so that you don't make the same mistakes I did. Because the price of a failed marriage is just way too high. And I would never want anyone to go through that. So let's start with a little experiment. I want you to close your eyes and imagine that your partner is tightly wrapping you in a blanket of love. And now imagine that the blanket melts away. Open your eyes. How did you feel? Your instinctual reaction to the blanket coming and going will put you in one of three categories. If you're like me, you felt safe and protected in that blanket. And you felt exposed when that blanket disappeared. And you, ha you are what we will call a fairy tale seeker. If you are like my ex-husband, then you felt trapped and suffocated in the blanket. And you felt free and relieved when the blanket disappeared. And you are what we will call a freedom seeker. As you can already tell, these two types of people are programmed very differently. And lastly, if you just felt happy in the blanket and sad when the blanket left, then you, then you are a secure attachment style. So the point of this experiment was for you to become aware of the patterned physiological responses your body already has and how they can create divides between people. Because what we think of as a blanket of love might feel really good for someone and might feel not really good for someone else. So this is already deeper than your thoughts. It's almost like an instinct. See? Science. Fascinating, isn't it? But maybe not everybody here is really that into science. Maybe you don't find this stuff really fascinating. So let me tell you how this can affect your life. If you don't get a handle on attachment theory, then let me tell you what, can, what your life can have in store for you. You could file for divorce within six weeks of getting married. True story, I did that. You could find yourself alone on the bathroom floor about to overdose on pain relievers. True story. I did that too. Or you could find yourself crashing into a house, almost killing someone, because you and your partner were arguing in the car. So divorce, suicide, and murder. Do I have your attention now? Yes. Attachment styles aren't inherently good or bad. But without the sufficient knowledge, some attachment combinations can become destructive. You might be thinking, well, love is all you really need. And I hate to break it to you, but that's just fake news. But here's what's real.
There are six different combinations that you can make with the types that we just discovered. But two of them are very rare, so we're going to just focus on these four. As you can see, the first three result in happy marriages. The last one, not so much. For those of you that, are secure, that have a secure attachment, you might be thinking, hey, I'm in a really good place. I have nothing to worry about. And that's probably true. You are in a good place. But you will still want to listen, because all of your friends that will have relationship issues will come asking you for advice. And for the remaining fairy tale seeker and freedom seekers, you might look at this and say, OK, so I have a one in three chance of ending up in a heartbreaking relationship. What's the big deal? Well, science shows us that, unfortunately, you have a much greater chance of ending up in that last bucket. And there's three reasons why. Number one, you find people with avoidant attachment style just plain boring. There isn't enough drama there for you. Number two, you often mistake emotional intensity for chemistry. And we can thank Hollywood and Bollywood for our distorted views on love for that. And number three, you're drawn to what is familiar. So if you're a fairy tale or a freedom seeker, then the opposite style exists in one of your parents. And so because you're already familiar with that, you're drawn to people that are like that as well. So you see, the solution is very simple. You have to stay away from the opposite attachment style. And you'll save yourself from all the heartache in the world. Or you can find a secure partner here, today maybe, and get married. I'd love to tell everyone I went to attend a wedding in Kyrgyzstan. I know that's not very realistic. And we can't control who we fall in love with. But we can prepare ourselves for marriage by understanding how attachment styles are set in childhood and how they dictate important decisions in our adult, in our adult lives. So let's take a look at my life as a child. Here I am, three years old, fairy tale seeker already. I used to stay up late with my mom, waiting for my dad to come home. As I got older, I started watching the clock. It was 6 p.m. By 6.15, I would have already called him three times and left him two voicemails. I was probably a pretty annoying kid. But I was begging him to come home and I couldn't understand why he was unreachable or unresponsive. So at some point, I concluded that he probably never wanted a family and that he didn't really love me. But the reality is that he's a freedom seeker, and freedom seekers need to disengage, they need to, they need to check out from time to time. And he was just playing out that attachment style. It had nothing to do with who I am. And now I understand why he often described himself as a caged bird. But I also made the same mistake in my marriage. When my freedom-seeking husband and I had our first big argument after the wedding, he went silent and slept on the couch for 10 days. I perceived it as rejection, and I felt abandoned. I concluded that he didn't really love me either. So we lost each other as spouses, and best friends. It was a double whammy. But wait, there's a silver lining, because there's always a silver lining. I got full custody on our dog, Caesar. And now that you all know my story, I trust that you won't do the same thing. You'll be wiser than I was, and you'll manage your conflicts in a constructive way, because conflicts are part of every close relationship. In fact, they arise from some of our deepest fears, most of which we never talk about. Fears such as separation, abandonment, loss of autonomy. The problem is that when conflict arises between a fairy tale seeker and a freedom seeker, they assume that the partner is the enemy. So they break up or they get divorced, and they start that cycle again with someone new. The only way out of that cycle is through self-knowledge, and compassion for our partners. The goal is to work together to improve the bounce-back rate. And what I mean by that 
is how efficiently can you and your partner identify the activated fear, fill that unmet need, and get back to being good. As the bounce back rate improves, both partners will feel that they are able to get what they need more easily and more reliably. They begin to, to trust each other. And together, they, they create a secure foundation of love. So now that we know the behavioral science behind intimate relationships, I'll leave you with a few tips. Number one, ask the blanket question on your first dates. It's fun, it's creative, and it's accurate. It's always better to know about attachment styles before things get too serious. And even if it doesn't lead to a second date, you'll be, you'll be educating tons of people on attachment theory, and I can't thank you enough for that. Number two, this one is specifically for my fellow fairy tale seekers. Build a self-soothe toolkit. This could include your self-talk audios, breathing exercises, a yoga routine, music playlists, pretty much a collection of all the things you can do on your own to help bring yourself back to center, no matter where you are and no matter what the stressful situation is. And lastly, this tip is for the freedom seekers. Communicate before you need to check out. Taking a time out is perfectly acceptable. And by letting your partner know when you'll be back, you'll have a happy partner to return to. Now we can harness the best of nerdy science in the area of personal relationships. So let's commit to following our hearts and taking our brains with us. It's the most important step towards creating a happily ever after. Thank you. Thank you.